Can we say praise the Lord, everybody? <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh my God. It's, it's, it's been a few. Uh, we didn't even open in prayer. Father in heaven, we ask your blessings on this time that you've given us to share uh, in this great Bible study from the book of Ephesians. We pray that you would bless every student of the Bible, that we would open up our ears to hear our minds, to understand, hide this word in our hearts, that we like David would not sin against thee, the blessings of the Lord, that they might flow and continue to flow and overflow in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and the people said, amen. 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 God bless all of you. Well, <clears throat> we're still in chapter four. Four is in three parts. Uh, on last week, we talked about a worthy uh, walk where the spirit of the Lord uh, is, is moving us through, uh, in charge of us, one, look, one faith, one baptism, all of those things that bring us together with unity, excuse me, with unity. Tonight, we wanna talk about embracing a full-bodied uh, ministry. And so perhaps a motivation uh, as motivation, rather, uh, uh, Paul reminded uh, the Ephesians of the gracious gifts that Christ gave his church following his ascension to heaven. And such grace or gifts included uh, the offices of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers, all of which were designed to equip the saints for ministry and to bring the entire body of Christ to maturity, not only through Christ's unity, but then through the, uh, the mediatory offices uh, of the earthly gifts uh, here on earth to uh, bring us to maturity. Uh, in this way, then, the Ephesians would not uh, be misled by false doctrine, uh, certainly uh, by false teachers, but instead uh, by speaking the truth in love, uh, the Ephesians would grow in Christ as each member uh, does his or her share for the edifying of the body uh, in love. So tonight we wanna focus on verses uh, seven through 16. Again, as we talk about embracing a full, uh, bodied ministry. Um, and so as we begin this uh, particular study, uh, Swindoll is extremely uh, detailed in this uh, uh, chapter four, this uh, verses seven through 16 of, of chapter four, because it introduces uh, some spiritual gifts uh, given by the Holy Spirit. The entire topic of spiritual giftedness is clearly important uh, for an understanding um, um, of our Christian life. Paul directly addresses this issue in a number of places uh, in his epistles, most specifically in the book of Romans, there in chapter 12. He also addresses it uh, specifically addressing tongues or the uh, or the or or, or or part of what prompted that discussion in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 uh, was on uh, was on tongue speaking and without interpretation, without an interpreter. Uh, but Paul took that uh, as an occasion to really give us the most uh, detailed uh, list. I think there's like 17 uh, gifts of the spirit identified uh, there in um, uh, First Corinthians. And then in Ephesians chapter four, we have four or five, depending on how we define pastor and teacher, whether they are a combined um, a group uh, or they're each in the singular, uh, pastors separate from teachers, et cetera. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we get a little closer to that. But, uh, but these were the leadership gifts that the spirit of the, of the Lord had given to the church going forward. 
therefore, um, um, okay. Oh Lord, I don't wanna. Okay, so in each of these passages, uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, uh, Paul not only described various gifts given to individual believers, but also explained the purpose of those gifts. And those that purpose is uh, to glorify God and to edify the body of Christ. All gifts must be operated in love, and they're there for the glorification of God and certainly to build up or to edify. The word build up and edify, uh, same Greek words, uh, the body of Christ or the church. And so here in our text tonight, the 7 through 16, uh, we'll see that Paul expects a great deal of diversity in the church as different people exercises their gifts. At the same time, however, Paul points us to God's ultimate reason for giving spiritual gifts to people in the first place. That is, again, so that we might obtain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Uh, that's the uh, reason given forth um, in verse uh, 13. But we know it's for the perfecting of the saint. We know it's for the edifying the body and certainly to bring us uh, both in the unity, which is verses one through six really defined for us in, in the unity, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, tism, unified. And then here, there is a level of maturity being addressed and called for uh, going, going forward. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to pull up my, uh, my Bible on this other phone, but uh, uh, <laughs> Windows 7 <laughs> has come back to get me, y'all. <laughs> Jackie keeps saying, you need to get rid of it, Reverend, get rid of it. I can't get rid of it. I, I like Windows 7. Well, <laughs> then you have to put up with her temperament, Windows 7's temperament. Uh, verses 7 through 8. Let, let, here's NIV. NIV said, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ uh, 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 apportioned it, it, apportioned it, it being the grace. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captive and gave gifts to the people. Amen. When Christ ascended, he took many captive. We're gonna we're gonna look at that uh, that whole expression. Uh, what's what's being explained there? Do you want us to read it in the New King James, or you good with this? Um, yeah, because I can't get, I can't seem to find mine going forward. Read, okay. read it in the. Uh, it, it, I'll take the New King James. In the New King James, verses seven and eight reads thus: To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. Now you want me to pull it up on my iPad and bring it to you? <laughs> no, I got an iPad down here. I just can't advance the slide now. She wants to. There you uh, go. Yeah, but I missed one. Okay. There it is. Um, so beginning in uh, chapter, chapter four, verse seven, uh, with a mild contrast here, uh, Paul uh, is saying, but to each one of us, uh, uh, Paul is con contrasting here verses four through six of the previous verse to where he's bringing us to now, where he sets out this oneness litany. He talked about, again, the unity, being one body, one spirit, one hope, 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism. He talked about the one God and Father of all, showing unity as part of the overall picture of what each one of us has been called to do. Uh, here in our uh, text tonight, uh, beginning in, in, in chapter seven forward, he says, Paul also insists that unity is not the same as uniformity uh, and harmony is not monotony, uh, monotony, okay? Instead, he says that the perfect picture of the church is diversity in unity. Whereas each person working in his or her unique capability toward a common goal. And we know that common goal is the actual uh, full bodied ministry where everybody in the body is engaged in uh, the work of ministry uh, as they are working out their own giftedness. And so when Paul says to each one of us, we can personalize that expression. That is, Paul is referring to, 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 to you or to, 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 to me specifically. He says, to you, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, and, and Christ is the one that blesses, he shows favor, and he's also the one that, 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 that gives us uh, the gifts through the Holy Spirit for the perfecting of the saints as we are laboring together in the body of Christ, okay? So you have been called by God. We've been saved by the death and resurrection of Christ. And now we come to understand that we are sealed. We'll get to chapter six. We'll talk about the sealing uh, through the Holy Spirit, but we're sealed by the Holy Ghost. Uh, God, uh, God calls the Savior saves, the Holy Ghost seals us until the day of redemption. The immeasurable grace of God has been extended to each one of us. You, he's been extended, to, that, that grace has been extended to me personally. And so to many Christians, however, settled for the grace of salvation, they don't have a problem with that, that's the saving grace. And but they've never realized that God has also given them the grace of sanctification. That is the enabling grace that allows us to, to stay cool in a hot position. It allows us to stay uh, uh, focused in, in foggy conditions. It gives us this, this cool, calm, and collected uh, uh, ability to face our trials, troubles, and our tribulations. The sanctification is the separation from coming out from among the world and the cares of the world. And that enables us, that enabling grace is what sustains us in those uh, dark and evil and wicked times. And so uh, though we have been given Christ's gift, which places us into the body of Christ, many Christians then fail to receive Christ's gifts, plural, which equips us to minister in and to the body of Christ. So one is God's gift, I'm sorry, one is Christ's gifts that places us uh, it's by, by salvation. We have the gift of salvation, um, uh, eternal life, et cetera, all of those things uh, are projected from uh, or the byproduct of our faith in Jesus Christ. But there's also the gifts, and there's, and he's kind of, Swindoll's kind of doing a play on words here, uh, for we uh, attribute our gifts from the Holy Ghost, but all of those, uh, all members of the triune, all members of the Godhead are working in harmonious agreement uh, bringing us uh, what we actually need uh, to get us through the trials and troubles of life. Uh, he says, but again, um, to every one of us is given grace. I like the fact that that grace is according to a particular measure from the gift of God or, or Christ, I should say the gift of Christ. So in 
verse 8 of our text, Paul paraphrases Psalm 68, this, this whole notion about ascending and descending. Um, um, Paul kind of lifts that. Uh, he doesn't go into great details in, in the book of Ephesians, but and he's talking to, for the most part, Gentiles would not have known uh, the Psalm of David, et cetera, and all that David would have said in the 68th division of Psalm, Psalms. But, but we can look in to the mind of Paul and, and, and grasp, if you will, what he had in mind when he just brings this up. You know, why, why are you bringing this up? And Paul wants us to know that, that, that this gift that we have from Christ, uh, when he rose from the dead uh, and was among us for those 40 days, he ascended. Every, every Christian knows about the ascension uh, from the Mount of Olives. Jesus rose into the clouds. Two angels came and, and, and appeared, telling the men of Galilee, why stand you? here gazing up, this same Jesus is coming again. So that ascension is part of Jew and Gentile understanding in Christianity. But he says, but, he's, but he wants us also to know, Paul wants us also to know that there is this idea of, of uh, Jesus taking captive those who were held in captivity. And um, and, um, and then he gives gifts to the body of Christ because of that. And so Paul um, opens up that door. <laughs> now he's got to, uh, we, we, we want an explanation. What are you talking about, Paul? And Swindoll takes a deep dive into that section that I, I was hesitant whether to go down that road with him. But I said, well, let, let me give Ebenezer. Those of you can handle it and understand it will we'll appreciate it. Those that can't. Just bear with me about three or four slides, okay? But but he's paraphrasing out of Psalm 68, 18 and applying an important Old Testament image to a New Testament contract, context. That is, in that Psalm, David calls for God to rescue his people and to vindicate them as he had done so in the past. And the Lord had led his people in triumph during the Exodus. Okay, so as, so as Mount Sinai was quaking, if you as you read the Psalm sixty eight, and the kings of the earth was being scattered, uh, then God set Himself upon His own holy mountain, and received gifts from the men who had been scattered. Paul now applies this picture to Christ's ascension because he saw it as the, as the potent representation of God's triumph. What God did at Sinai in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ did on, Mount, on the Mount of Olives, uh, uh, having uh, come down and then gone back up. Uh, and uh, and uh, it represents uh, a triumph over the things of this earth, okay? And so after Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection, uh, Christ led his people to freedom, all who believe, all who are called by his name, and uh, ascended in victory. Uh, he led captive a host of captives, um, um, uh, seated, he has seated the believers with him spiritually in heaven, uh, there is this notion that we are uh, seated together in, in heavenly places. Um, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, uh, and though we were once enemies of God, uh, we have been brought into uh, God's family. That is through the resurrection, I'm sorry, the, the reconciliation of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So, so there is a, a Psalm 68 then is a portrayal, a portrait of, uh, of the life of Christ uh, from beginning to end, from descending to ascending back uh, from whence he had come. 
So once bound by sin and subject to the kingdom of Satan, we have uh, we have been taken captive by Christ, apprehended I think is, is what Paul uses uh, in, um, in the Philippian text, uh, having been apprehended uh, and, and, and taken captive. And we are joint heirs in the kingdom of heaven. And so while Psalm 68 speaks simply of God receiving the spoils of war from his enemies, okay, because they took all of the, the, the gold out of, not all of the gold, but they took a majority of the gold out of Egypt uh, during the Exodus, which, which, which was used, if you remember, uh, to, to lavishly ornate the, uh, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness, uh, uh, the gold that was uh, overlaid on the Ark of the Covenant and all of the other sh uh, pieces of furniture that was in the uh, holies of holies in the holy place. Uh, all that gold came from, from Egypt for the 430 years of unpaid, uh, let me use the word, reparation <laughs> for slavery. And, um, and so th this is, this is a, a, an analogy of that, the spoils of war from his enemy. So Paul indicates that Christ's conquer of sin, death, and the devil resulted in the distribution of the wealth he received through his victory. So upon whom did, so the question can be, upon whom did Christ shower these gifts? And so Paul answers the question in verse 11. If you notice verse 11 uh, is in parentheses, it's a parenthetical insertion. Um, almost uh, verses, uh, not verse 11, I'm sorry, um, uh, verses, uh, verses 9 and 10, I'm sorry, uh, represents a, uh, uh, a parenthetical phrase, it's verses 9 down through verse, uh, verse 10. And, and so Paul is giving us this ascension and descension uh, narrative to help us to understand what God did in Psalm 68, uh, defined by David, and what Christ has done for us uh, in the bringing about of our salvation. So Paul does provide an answer, those gifts. What gifts? He provides those gifts uh, in verse 11, uh, after a brief um, parenthetical insertion in verses 9 and 10, okay? So he says, what does he ascended mean, except that he also, I'm sorry, what does he ascended means, mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Uh, verse 10 said, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So, so just to bring this up, um, having led captivity captive, uh, uh, Paul is saying that he went, Christ went he came from a place, descended down before he ascended up back to earth, back to heaven. So he came from heaven to earth, descending, and then from earth back to heaven in his ascension or ascending. And so the question then is asked, you know, so what, what do you mean he ascended and descended before he gave gifts to us? Well, if you go from verse eight to verse 11, he's saying these are the gifts he gave. But wait a minute, where, where, where does this captivity thing come from? Well, he, asc he, desc he ascended, okay? Uh, uh, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first? So let me stick to the text so I don't confuse myself sometimes. So the mention, the mention of Christ's 
ascension led, leads Paul to a short parenthetical thought in which he gives his reader a brief insight into some facts surrounding this victorious event, okay? Paul states that the phrase, he ascended, emphasized the fact that Christ must have also descended first. If he's the son of God, before he can go from earth to heaven, he must have come from heaven down to earth, okay? Uh, the virgin birth, certainly, and the, uh, and the, uh, the overshadowing, uh, overshadowing of, uh, of the Virgin Mary um, and, and the, the whole notion of Emmanuel, uh, God with us, Emmanuel. Uh, but from where did he descend and how far down did he go? And so this question has irked Bible scholars for centuries. And there's three major interpretations um, which are common to our understanding. The first one is perhaps the descent refers to the incarnation itself. That is in which the divine son of God descended from heaven to take on a human nature. That is Paul's words here would then be parallel to and similar to those found in Philippians chapter two, where it says that he made himself of no reputation, but took on the form of, uh, of, of, of flesh, of, of, of human, humanity, took on humanity and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, okay? Is that what he's referring to? Well, that's plausible because in this case, the phrase into the lower parts of the earth could be translated into the lower parts, namely the earth itself, just on the surface of the earth. But then as a subset of this view, some scholars say that Paul could have had in mind the lower parts of the earth, namely the tomb, as it's oftentimes referred into the belly of the earth, where in, in Job's case, uh, um, um, uh, uh, Jonah's case, uh, he, just, he was in the belly of the whale or in the belly of the earth, and therefore it refers to being buried. Okay, and that's plausible, and certainly there's scriptures that support that. So in any case, in any case, the earthly physical sphere would be what Paul would have had in view if that's Paul's intent in that first, uh, first example. The second interpretation, perhaps the descent referred to an event following Christ's ascension. That is when the Holy Spirit descended upon the church at Pentecost and bestowed gifts on the body of Christ, okay, in Acts chapter two. So uh, even though Christ and the Holy Ghost are two different persons of the persons of the Godhead, uh, their, their actions are, are interchangeable in that as one goes up, the other one comes down, the Holy Spirit comes down, okay. Uh, and if that be the view, this would be similar to Christ's promise to send the Holy Spirit after he had ascended up to the Father, that is coming to them in the spiritual sense through the Spirit's presence in the church as cloven tongues and remaining with us all through the church age, the Holy Ghost is, is spiritually present with us as the comforter. So he is the one that has descended down to us when Christ ascended up to, to be seated at the right-hand side of God. The third view uh, uh, is interesting as well. Perhaps the descent refers to the time between Christ's death and his resur resurrection. As that is to say that many Christians believe that after his death on the cross, Christ descended into the part of the departed spirits, or the place rather of the departed spirits, proclaiming victory over the wicked spirits in bondage, as well as leading Old Testament saints 
on a victorious ascent to paradise. Okay. That that he descended further, not only to the surface of the earth to walk among men, but he went down into the belly of the earth as 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 you might refer to as as, as death or dying in the grave, but he even went further down. And so Swindoll, and I agree with Swindoll, this is what we were taught at the Washington Bible College, which is part of most of the professors came out of the Dallas Theological Seminary and all of them, of which Chuck Swindoll as well, uh, had the same um, uh, understanding of um, theology uh, as um, Henry, Henry Louis Schaefer. Uh, the great philosopher and, um, and professor at Dallas. Um, uh, most evangelicals uh, have this same uh, understanding. And so, so we lean toward this third interpretation, that is the view of Christ descending to the spiritual realm known as Sheol in Hebrew or Hades in the Greek between those between the time of his death and his resurrection uh, from, from, from uh, three o'clock Friday, 3, p 3 p.m. Friday until before sunrise, just before the sun got up <laughs> in, uh, on that Sunday morning, okay? Where was Jesus? We know his body was in the grave, but where was his spirit, where was his soul and his spirit? And that's the descending part that Paul is referencing here that gave him the all, the all power and gave him the ability to give the gifts, okay? That is to say that between his death and resurrection is extremely ancient and enduring in the history of the church. In fact, in the Apostles' Creed, uh, most of the early church fathers recited countless, countless church, uh, churches worldwide stated that Christ was crucified, dead and buried, and he descended into Hades. Uh, you can hear this in the Apostles' Creed in some of the uh, uh, churches that are uh, um, part of certain uh, denominations. But Christ, no matter how you, you, you're you viewing this, uh, you, you've got to come to understand that Christ came down to be with us, fulfilled his uh, earthly mission, uh, part of which was to die for the sins of the world, and then to, um, uh, to bring into captivity. This word captivity is not a negative term. It's It's it's, uh, it's a phrase that uh, means that you now have possession what was previously somebody else's possession. You've now captured it. Usually during a time of war or combat, you capture a town or you capture their weapons or you capture their, their airplanes. You know, it's, 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 it's now I have possession. And in the previous um, uh, uh, Old Testament understanding, that when, when, when individuals died, they went to the place of, of the dead, that there was no um, escape, all men die. Uh, Job talks about that, it's appointed under men, um, a man born a woman is a few days and full of trouble and, and then we die, you know, we come up like a flower and we die, there was, it, there was no escaping of this death. But in Jesus, who is life eternal, he went down to the place of death and he has captured from the enemy, okay, the power to hold people in death, okay? Now Jesus has the power. He captured that power and brought them back with him and he delivered the Old Testament saints, amen, to glory. And we'll talk about that a little further if there's any additional questions. But I, I am in full agreement that this uh, descending, uh, in order for him to go up, he first had to descend, and he descended not only to earth for three and a half uh, for the for the thirty-three 
uh, 32 and a half years, almost 33 years, he also uh, went down into the lower parts, led those from, from Abraham forward uh, that were in, in the faith and brought them back and delivered them into uh, the hand of the Lord and promises all of us from this day, from that day forward to be absent from the body is now to be present with the Lord because he is now the, the superintendent of the dead, Jesus is in Christ. Now, if you are out of Christ, you still going to hell and you got to deal with Satan. But those who are, <clears throat> excuse me, that are in the family of God, Jesus Christ, amen. When you are absent from your physical body, you will forever be in the presence of the living God, Jesus. Pastor, in, in, in some of my studies, I, I read something that I thought was, was very, very profound and pertinent to this particular situation this, of, of Christ descending into okay. the lower parts. And, and what it said was that he descended for, for one of the purposes for which his, he descended was to let the Old Testament saints know that atonement had been accomplished. Amen. <laughs> that that gave them okay. their deliverance as well. Yes, and, 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 and having let those, and what you've been waiting for is done. Amen. You, you, Amen you've that. been waiting to see this day, this day has happened. And wow. then he led them back to the place of rest in, in, in heaven with, with God in him. Amen to and that. So that, that just blessed me. And when, when you were talking, I just thought about it and said, you know, maybe I just kind of share that and, and get your, your take on that. But he, he not Amen. only descended, but he had a purpose for descending. And as a matter of fact, when I thought about it, he had to do it so that he could give those Old Testament saints the, the privilege of knowing that they've been delivered. That, that well, what I was waiting for has already has been accomplished. Well, keep in mind that that part of the mystery that Paul reveals uh, to us here in in the first chapter of of, uh, of Ephesians, this mystery, a, a sacred, divine sacred secret, a divine sacred secret, once concealed, now revealed. Okay. Um, uh, Satan had no, no thought, no idea of, uh, uh, of the power that Jesus would have post-resurrection. It says even in the scripture that had Satan known this, he would not have killed the God of glory. He, he'd have let Jesus <laughs> run his course and, 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 and just, uh, you know, do whatever he, he did. But because he because Jesus died for our sins and Satan was instrumental in, 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 in uh, perpetrating that through, through the scheme with Judas, uh, through the betrayal uh, with the Sanhedrin and, and, and the, the, the Sadducees and the, and, and the Pharisees, et cetera, all of that, he's working behind the scene for that, that, that put Jesus in this position where he would then be accused and crucified uh, Satan would not have entered into any of those uh, deviant plans had he known that by killing Jesus. But that was the plan all along, that those that were in the Old Testament death uh, uh, sentence could not be delivered. That's why they were in Abraham's bosom, which is a euphemism for the fact that they're in Abraham's faith, the faith of Abraham one God, one, uh, one deliverer, uh, uh, God and father of us all is, is in Satan, I'm sorry, in, uh, that's in Abraham. And he, even though Abraham is not the first one to, uh, to come to that knowledge, certainly it goes all the way back to Adam. Um, but from Adam, the time between Adam and Abraham, there were many other um, uh, iterations uh, that's, that's, that Satan had perpetrated false religions and uh, false gods, false witness uh, 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 idols, et cetera, et cetera, went, went forward. My point is so that when those who died in the faith could not go up to heaven at that time because there was no one to uh, uh, break that cycle 
uh, no, no man and no angel and no, no prophet, no angel had that authority to break that, 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 uh, that connection. The soul that sins must die, okay, out of, out of uh, Ezekiel. And so, and so uh, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So those principles were holding uh, those new Old Testament saints in, in that grave. But Jesus, <laughs> who is he that was slain from the foundation of the world, he who came in fulfillment, he whose blood, amen, washes away all of that, okay, and breaks that cycle, breaks that, 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 that hole that, uh, that death had on us, and not only held death, but also the grave, okay? And so when Jesus died and rose from the, from the dead, he rose with all power. <laughs> Do not underestimate the power and authority that Jesus Christ has been given, okay? All of that has been, been, been laid into his hand. So while he was in the lower parts himself having to die, because of the human side of him, okay? He went down there, but he he wasn't subject to the same hold that death had on Adam and, and Abraham and the rest of the, 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 the saints, okay? The only two people that's not down there is Enoch and, and, and Elijah, okay? Elijah. Uh, Enoch was translated and Elijah went to heaven on a fiery chariot. Everybody else is down there. <laughs> Uh, maybe Moses. I, 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 I don't. Nobody could tell you where Moses is at, but Moses could very well be down there as well. But my point is this: so now that Jesus has been killed by the by by his enemies, uh, uh, mutilated, uh, 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 mistreated, rather uh, betrayed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, he now goes down there and he takes the keys. <laughs> From Satan, I can imagine Satan standing there with the keys uh, to, to, to hell, death, and the grave around his waist, and Jesus just snatches it right off of him. Give me these keys. You you've done for. And 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 even though uh, hell in the grave, we still we have one last enemy, which is death, and, and because we are still in this physical, we who are the modern day New Testament saints, we still have to have to have to go through this door. Uh, called physical death, but he's already said to, to Paul, Paul, tell my people that when they're absent from that body, that corrupt body, that, that body that cannot uh, uh, inherit a eternal life, this flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life, tell them when they take that off, they can step right across into eternal life. They'll be, they'll be present with me, okay? And Satan didn't know that until Jesus rose on that third day morning, not only got himself up, well, God raised him, but I mean, the, 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 the technically he, he, he rose from the dead and he's bringing all of those Old Testament saints with him. So I think what Paul wants us, wants us to know that the gift of Christ is not only salvation, but this gift of Christ is also uh, this, this, this freedom uh, uh, to know that we have a life beyond the grave. Oh, how do I know that? Well, he went down into the grave and he captured those who, are, who were Old Testamently captured and he brought them back and he delivered them up and he brought them and gave them, uh, 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 brought them into, into heaven, into glory. Uh, so so we'll, 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 we'll talk about that uh, uh, going forward, but hallelujah. Any, any, any comments or questions? So <clears throat> whatever disagreement I'll, uh, the scholars and, and theologians might have over how one interprets uh, verse nine, they all agree on the essential meaning of verse 10 that he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, 
that he might feel all things. So, so we know he's seated at the right hand side of God. We find that in the in, in book of Hebrews uh, as, a, as a scripture text. Christ ascended to the Father so that he might feel all things. And this last phrase tells us that Christ did not ascend simply to leave the world behind him. No, no. Rather, Christ ascended so that he might expand his presence and influence in the world. The world. A whole wide world. How is that? When we look in John chapter 16, we get a glimpse of what, uh, what is being stated here. Jesus himself tells us, he says, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So here earlier, Jesus had said that through the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church, the comforter, the paraclete, the helper, he himself would come to dwell among his people, that we would never, ever be alone. And now, how, how's, how's that possible? Jesus, you, you in heaven, you, sit, you are seated on the right-hand side of God. How, how can you say you will never leave us nor forsake us? I have sent you the comforter. He will never leave you nor forsaken you. And we're all on the same uh, uh, team uh, as it relates to uh, uh, sal salvation for humanity. Even in Colossians, Paul calls this the mystery, which is Christ in you, uh, that we have the Holy Ghost um, uh, in us. Um, uh, we know it's the Holy Ghost that does the indwelling. Uh, when I hear people say, well, I got Jesus in my heart. Well, uh, technically, it's, 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 it's the Holy Ghost, but I understand um, uh, it's a technical term. I'm, I'm not going to argue with you on that. As long as you say, as long as you know you got a member of the Godhead inside you, it's, it's he is the third person and not the second person. But I, that I'm not going to split hairs about that. Uh, but certainly the Christ that's in you is the Holy Spirit that has indwelled you, that, is, that has regenerated you through being born again through that process, who is now have sealed you when we get to Ephesians chapter six, and he will be there to bring us uh, on the day of redemption, that, 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 that he that has begun this good work in us, he is able to complete it. Uh, to do it and, and complete it on the day of, of our redemption. So, so, so though Jesus has ascended to the heavenly um, uh, uh, bodily and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he can be truly present with us through the work of the Holy Spirit, whose presence bridges the distance between heaven and earth. This made it possible then for Christ to promise his disciples that in the day when the Holy Spirit comes, he said, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Isn't that wonderful that you got, you got Jesus in us because that same spirit that was in Jesus is the same spirit that is now in us. The Holy Ghost is the architect of our unity as well as the one that is bringing us to maturity. So when Christ sent the gift of the Holy Spirit from heaven, the, the Holy Spirit brought with him numerous gifts, which he distributed to every member of the body of Christ, just as he wills, okay? Uh, the, the need is expressed through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost knows what we need. And, and, and he's the one that raises up uh, and brings uh, those gifts to the front, to the fore. So Paul reasons like this. Christ descended and ascended, won him the spoils of victory and the blessings of the Holy Spirit from his exalted position 
Christ has led many in his victory train. Aren't you glad about that? That in turn, he has bestowed the gift of the Holy Spirit upon the church. It's his church. It is his body, Christ's body. He's the head of the church, and therefore the Holy Spirit is his, his, is his agent uh, on earth that is bringing about the maturity and the unity that is needed. The Holy Spirit manifests his power in the church through a multitude of spiritual gifts that differ in kind, okay? Same, same spirit, just, just different kind, amen. Um, uh, that, that, that we might all uh, work together. We're playing with holy fire. Uh, we know the spirit is a consuming fire, but he is the Holy Ghost fire that purges as well as purifies. He drives out, uh, purges and purifies, as well as perfects, amen, for what is left is that pure gold. Aren't you glad about that? I feel like preaching now. And so having ascended and descended, and that there's a gift that we get in verse 9, uh, verse 8 rather, uh, that we get uh, from, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, verse seven, where, where we have a measure of the gifts of Christ, okay? He says, these are the gifts in verse 11, so that Christ himself gave, uh, 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 the, gave the apostles, he gave some uh, apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay. Um, there are five passages in the New Testament that list approximately 20 spiritual gifts. Uh, and and, and uh, if there's 20, um, I want to, uh, uh, memory, sorry. Uh, administer, there's 20 administrative gifts, and there are five leadership gifts or, or offer, offices, office, uh, office gifts, or, 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 or gifts of office, okay? Um, and they're defined in uh, these uh, texts that you see there. Uh, Swindoll, in his commentary, defines a spiritual gift as a God-given ability or skill that enables a believer to perform a specific function in the body of Christ with efficiency and ease, okay? If it hurts doing it, that that ain't your gift. <laughs> if you complain about it, that ain't your gift. If you don't like doing it, that ain't your gift. If you would rather get paid than do it, that ain't your gift. <laughs> Spiritual gifts are given by the Lord and not by Christians. I can't get you, I can't give you a, a, a gift. I can't pour oil down your throat as I've heard, and, and get you to speak in tongues. Teaching, training, and experience can strengthen, and it can sharpen your spiritual gifts, but they cannot bestow them. You can't learn, you, can, you can't learn to be a preacher. I'm sorry, you can't learn to be a pastor. That has to come to you as a gift from God. Because, because if, you, if you make yourself a pastor, the first time hell and high water rises, you going bye-bye, I'm, I'm out of here. I, I, I <laughs> whatever your excuse is, uh, y'all don't pay me enough for this, or I didn't sign up for this. Uh, but, it, but if God assigned you, you can run, Jonah, but, but there's a whale gonna get you, okay? So, so you might as well stay where you is because running from it ain't going to deliver you from it. No, the Holy Ghost has to give and bestow that. They are spiritual gifts, okay? The emphasis is on the word spiritual, not because they are mythical 
impractical or subjective things, but because their power derives from or comes from the Holy Spirit. And they bring about real spiritual change in the lives of the people who are hungering and thirst for them. Again, it glorifies God, but it has to edify the body. And if the gift does not do that, you need to stop doing that because you're hurting people. You're not helping them. Okay. If your gift causes more confusion, headache, heartaches, and heartbreaks, you need to stop, sit down, and shut up because this, apparently the Holy Ghost is not operating in that at that time. Now, I'm not going to say you don't have the gift, but but you you might have it, but don't be like, like oh, Lord, I got the gift and I got to use it. What was that guy? On, uh, on the morning show anyway. Yeah, you, you, you can't, you don't use that gift. Because you're hurting people. Swindoll had a chart, and I just want to just kind of pull this out. I'm not going to get into it because it's, you know, this is a whole uh, subject all to itself. But here in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11 of Ephesians, mentions four personal ministries or leadership uh, gifts of gifted leaders in the church, but several other passages of scripture. Uh, list the kinds of spiritual gifts, what we call administrative uh, or, or working gifts that have been distributed um, uh, among the believers, okay? And um, as you notice here in Ephesians 4.11, uh, Swindoll kind of put pastor and teacher as one gift, okay? You can teach without pastoring, but it's impossible to pastor without teaching. But that's a different, uh, again, uh, we, we won't we won't we won't debate that and we won't lose our religion over over differences of opinion uh, but i wanted to just add that in there so you can look at that at your at your at your convenience but here are a few a few other vital facts about spiritual gifts uh, number one every believer has at least one spiritual gift with some having more than one, but there's usually a predominant one and one that is in less or one that uh, may be called upon uh, if, if there are already multiples of, the, of your dominant, uh, the, the spirit might lead you to your secondary uh, to work into that until he either moves you, he either moves some of them or he'll move you to a different vineyard, okay? Because the Holy Ghost is a good HR manager. He's not gonna put all of his, all of those who have this one gift all clustered together and they're starving uh, down the road or across town, okay? He's gonna move those things around, okay? Uh, spiritual gifts are given with our salvation, okay? and are useful to fulfilling God's call for us. So again, uh, these are some texts that talks about that, but the point being made that once you become a child of God, he gives you a work to do in the body of Christ. Nobody is attached as a parasite to the body of Christ. Everybody is, a, is part of the muscle, muscular or the skeletal or the nervous system of the body, you all, everyone has to do something. If not, then you're hanging on either as a virus or a cancer. The gifts are varied and feel, and they feel different roles, okay? And everybody can't be the eye. As, as Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians, and, and so where's the hearing? Well, if everybody was to hear, uh, where, where would be the seeing, okay? So some are more visible than others, okay? Uh, but there is no, there's no such thing as uh, unimportant or less important gift than those that are more visible. Just because the face is more visible can't say, well, I don't need the hands and I don't need my feet. Well, you're a pretty face without feet. You ain't going nowhere. You're just going to sit there. Or you can't feed yourself without your hands if you think your face is all that in, in a bag of chips, okay? All the gifts derive their power from the same source, okay? And so we're all tapped in, so nobody's is, 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 is 
there's no competition. I know we like to get into competition. Who's going to out sing? If singing is part of the uh, worship or praising of the Lord, uh, there's a natural ability to sing, and then there's a spiritual ability to sing. Uh, we call it the natural talent is called uh, singing. Um, the spiritual talent is called a joyful noise. <laughs> a joyful noise all right uh but it all comes from the from the triune god god gives he's the one that's giving the gifts he's saying that in the text here in chapter four so we are not to be tripping okay some of the other vital facts being that the uh, spiritual gifts are given not for one's own edification but for the common good and paul had to had to remind them those of you speaking tongues you you you're doing that you're edifying you because nobody else is there to, to interpret for the rest of us. We sit around and think, think you, you, you know, you, you are slobbering at the mouth and, and maybe you having a, um, a, a hissy fit. We don't know what's going on with you until somebody said, oh, he's saying, and then they give us an interpretation of what's being said. If not, then if there is no edification to the body, because you can't edify your own self. It is first to glorify God and then second to edify the body. And if neither one, and if you're not glorifying God, please don't try to edify the body. And if you're edifying the body and it doesn't bring glory to God, you need to sit down. And Paul will tell you in 1 Corinthians 13, if it ain't done in love, even though I have the tongue of, 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 of angels, uh, speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, it profits me nothing. Even though I give my body to be burned and I do all these, I can understand all prophecy, do all things, speak in all tongues. Say, Listen, if I don't have love, if I don't have charity, sit your crazy self down because something's going wrong with you. Something, something, something is wrong uh, in, in, in this, okay? All the gifts are meant to give glory to the one who so lavishly bestowed them on it. We know that to be God himself. And so the best and only foolproof way to learn and sharpen your spiritual gift is through ministry experience. It is through ministry experience, okay? That is, we need to roll up our sleeve The only way you're going to do that and improve on that and become better at that is you've got to then um, um, uh, <laughs> you've got to participate in administrative works, okay? So find an opportunity and then volunteer. okay? See a need, step into that need, give it a try. And again, if if it if it if it's if it if you are complaining about it, uh, you're uncomfortable about it, uh, or you you don't like it, this that and the other, that's not your gift. That you're in the wrong ministry. You 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 don't supposed to be in the kitchen, if 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 or 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 in leadership. If if you can't get along with the folks who are in leadership, okay, that's not your that's not your uh, gift from from God for the body. You will quickly discover, however, that the area in which the Holy Spirit have uniquely gifted you for ministry, because once you find that right ministry experience, once you're in the right place at the right time doing what the Lord has called you to do, you'd rather do that than eat. You would rather, you'd rather stay there than to go home uh, or, or, or come, you, you know, you, you you, 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 it becomes a labor of love for you. Yeah, yeah. So here in Ephesians, Paul focuses on the four types of gifted people given to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, and again, he doubles the two together uh, as pastor teachers, okay? Apostles. Um, apostleship is a general sense in a general sense, refer to people who are sent in an official capacity. That in the New Testament, it often had a more technical meaning. One of which then is apostle had, had to have seen the risen 
Savior, okay? If you have not seen him uh, in his post-resurrected uh, position, uh, you could not then be an apostle. That's why it's so important that Paul had that Damascus Road visual encounter because he's seen the risen Savior and therefore was commissioned to be an apostle to the Gentiles, okay? Uh, they had to have been endowed by God with the ability to do amazing signs and wonders, had to follow them, okay? Uh, we saw that with Peter, uh, even as, as, as his shadow uh, passed by the sick, amen, they were, they were healed. Uh, they had cloths of uh, prayer cloth that was given out and that those that held those prayer cloths, uh, they too were also healed. Uh, but these signs and wonders were used to confirm their gospel message, okay? It's like the miracles that Jesus performed prior to the discourse on, on the, uh, on the uh, nature of that miracle, okay? So if he gave sight to a blinded man, then he would give a message on, uh, I am the light of the world, okay? He would feed 5,000 and then give a message on, uh, I am the bread of life, okay? And so these miracles that uh, and signs that were performed by Peter, James, and, and John, and the other disciples uh, were used to authenticate their gospel message that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. He is uh, the Savior, the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the one that was crucified, uh, but is risen from the dead. Their labor produced fruit among unreached people, while at the same time they are establishing churches both far and wide. And we know that to be true of Paul uh, going forward, okay? Paul was the apostle, but Timothy was never referred to as an apostle, and Silas was not called an apostle. Moreover, they were gifted with unparalleled wisdom, which rendered their messages absolutely authentic, uh, um, authoritative, okay? Uh, that they spoke with apostolic authority. Uh, based on all the uniqueness of this ministry, there are no official apostles today. Now, I know there's some folk running around here calling themselves an apostle, but again, based on first century, there, there was a lot of first century uh, uh, church fathers that never claimed themselves to be an apostle. Here we are 2,000 years ago, all of a sudden there's folk running around saying, I'm an apostle. Okay, okay, how many folks have you raised from the dead? Uh, okay, okay, but I'm not gonna get into that, all right? Uh, I'm just telling you, uh, I'm just reporting the news right now. Uh, prophets is the second office, and like the gift of apostleship, the, God, the, the gift of prophecy was also regarded in scripture as fundamental, as a fundamental ministry of the church and therefore historically temporary. Um, um, prophets were few and far between. There were never, uh, even though was, there was a school for prophecy under the uh, prophet Elisha, okay? But it was never meant to be a, um, a, um, a, a large group of folks that, you know, like deacons might be or like choir members, okay? Prophets were, would, would learn and, 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 and come together and, and study the scripture, but they were sent on a mission. And many of them, as we look in the Old Testament, um, um, uh, some were more prominent, prominent than others, but all of them had, uh, had this one uh, provision and that is, in order to be a true prophet, all your prophecies had to come true. If one of your prophecies failed to materialize, materialize as true, you were deemed a false prophet and you were taken out and stoned to death. So, 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 so if you are a choir member and you say you can sing, and if you can't sing, we take you out and stone you to death, and maybe we won't have so many folks. Uh, but again, the same thing holds true 
uh, as a prophet or whoever, or deacons or ministers, preachers, uh, hey, you either, either you is or you ain't, okay? And, uh, and certainly prophet uh, was one very visible, both apostle and prophet. So there was only a limited of only 14 apostles according to New Testament, okay? The 12 and then Matthias and then Paul, that's 14, right? There were multiple prophets, but all of them did not reach the level of notoriety uh, as uh, many in the Old Testament. And as Christ came, we oft time refer to him as the last prophet, okay? Prophet, priest, and king. Jesus oft time referred to as prophet, priest, and coming king. Prophet of the old, uh, prophet while he walked, a uh, priest while he is now in heaven uh, after the order of Melchizedek and in future tense will he be the, uh, we'll, we'll crown him king, he's already king, uh, but we will crown him the, the king of glory uh, at the coronation, okay? Uh, so prophets, uh, prophets were the unique mouthpiece of God and like Old Testament prophets, the prophets of the early church foretold the future. Uh, Agabus uh, is, is referred to as a prophet. There was one that told Paul what would happen to him going forward. And so there are some occasions where we see some prophetic, uh, prophetic uh, uh, utterances going forward, narratives in, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts. Um, foretold the future and exalted. They encouraged and strengthened God's people. These prophets would reveal the word of God when the New Testament, uh, they revealed the word of God when the New Testament had not yet been completed or collected. But after that, uh, uh, when it was collected, et cetera, um, um, you know, we had it in our hands. We didn't need for you to speak for God. We had the written form of the word of God through 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 Paul's uh, uh, writings and the uh, the gospel writers etc uh, going forward the general epistles going forward all were canonized and referred to by that first century church uh, and and canonized by the third century uh, as being the inspired inerrant and infallible word of God and they closed those other written books and said, no, we don't need any of the others. Uh, these um, uh, 27 New Testament books, along with our 39 Old Testament uh, scrolls are, are sufficient. These 66 books are sufficient for our understanding uh, of the mind of God and his will. So after the completion of the New Testament, the gifts of both apostle and prophets wound down. Today, the gift to carry the message to unbelievers is carried out by evangelists and pastor teachers, okay? So the prophet need not go into these unheard of places or unbelieving uh, places where unbelievers might be and say, woe unto you, thus saith the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. That's what evangelists, missionaries, et cetera, uh, pastors and teachers, uh, or modern day elders, however you want to refer to those, overseers, uh, bishops are, is another term that has come of, come of um, that's in, in, the, in, the, it's in the Bible, uh, as an overseer to, 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 to the sheep and the flock of God. Evangelists, as traveling ministers similar to itinerant preachers or missionaries of today, evangelists brought the gospel to non Christian groups. We see that in the book of Acts. Uh, the first deacon, Philip, was, a, was also referred to as an evangelist as he spoke um, um, uh, the word of God to the Ethiopian unit, I want to say there in, in, in Acts chapter 8. They often started churches or further developed those established by apostles. So when Paul would leave, he would bring in evangelists like Timothy and, and Silas were evangelists because he would send them forward uh, or send them back to uh, previously uh, preached areas 
uh, to see how the churches were doing. And he himself would also go back as a quote unquote missionary to make sure that they were uh, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. A gifted evangelist possesses a specific ability to communicate the gospel, to make it practically plain and relevant to unbelievers and to keep, I'm sorry, and to help hesitant people take the step of faith. The result of their efforts are often numerically um, impressive. They, uh, I mean, you could, you could call the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost an evangelist who stood up and preached and proclaimed and communicated the gospel to the point that numerically 3,000 people joined the church that afternoon. Good God from a burning world. You talk about a door opener, <laughs> an invitation to Christian discipleship. Be that as it may, uh, we all must share in carrying out the Great Commission. And so it's not just for those who, um, uh, as, as Swindoll said, we should never be tempted to lead evangelism to the experts, okay? Well, they, that's the, they, they got a title, they must be the, no, no, we all are responsible for carrying the gospel message to that corner of the area in which we travel. Christ wants all of us to spread his message among our friends, to make our friends God's friends, okay? And so you're going to meet people that, 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 that the next person may not ever meet. You have coworkers that nobody's going to be able to communicate with but you. And then the fourth group uh, of, of leadership, gifted leadership, is the pastor-teacher uh, model. The two terms, pastor and teacher, are linked grammatically in the Greek text. And so Swindoll puts them together. Paul uses one article for the two terms. Though they can be distinctive or distinguished, Paul likely had in mind a close association between pastor and teacher. It's, uh, it's unique, it's, it's quite likely rather that pastors and teachers refer to roles of the elders in the churches whose responsibility it was to shepherd and to teach, okay? So you're not only leading the flock as, an, as a bishop or an over, overseer or pastor, quote unquote, but you're also teaching them. Um, uh, I think he, did, he does give an explanation here. The pastor shepherds the flock, okay, by meeting the day-to-day -day needs of the congregation, that is counseling and confronting and correcting and, and comforting and guidance or guiding, as well as... Uh, the individual who taught the flock through the teaching and the preaching of the word. So there's not only the day-to-day, -day, Monday through Saturday, uh, uh, guidance and counseling that is being done by, quote-unquote, the elder. Um, it could very well be the same elder then will also get up on Sunday morning and teach and preach. You don't ever want to preach without some teaching in there, okay? You don't want to go over their heads. You want to go into their hearts. So you got to reach their mind in their hearts. You want to preach and teach the word of God. Uh, so this gift has not changed over the millennium. Leaders functioning as pastors and teachers do the same work in the church today that their predecessors accomplished centuries ago. Note that these brief descriptions of apostles and prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers exemplify the care God has for his church. God did not leave the church orphaned with nobody to teach or to comfort, to shepherd, or to nurture them in their fledgling faith. The Lord superintends over his people. Instead, we know that he sent his spirit. Jesus gave us the comforter whose grace so transformed the lives of believers 
that they would be used by God to build up the body of Christ, both the local church and the universal church throughout the world. All believers belong to the universal church and soon as possible are to unite with some local church where they can carry out their giftedness and their assignment. Comments or questions? God gave some, that's God's work, for the purpose. The purpose is to edify the saints. Amen. For the edifying of the, of the saints. I, I like the way King James um, uh, calls it out. Uh, for the perfecting, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, one. For the work of the ministry, which is two. And then for the edifying of the body. You notice they all begin with the preposition for. For the edifying of the saints, for the work of the service or the, or the ministry. Um, and then thirdly, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until, until when rather, Reverend? Until we all come into the unity of chapters of, of uh, verses one through six, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, okay? He's already talked about our unity. Now he's talking about the, uh, he's gonna now bring us to, 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 to this notion of about our maturity, okay? Unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of God unto the, prefer, unto the perfect man and then unto the measure of the statue of the fullness <laughs> of Christ. Let me step on the clock. Okay, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting behind schedule here. Okay. Um, uh, we, we, we understand this final part here when I'm not going to read that. Uh, I'm gonna spend time just just explaining that going forward. So we must allow then the, 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 the totality of Ephesians chapter four to rem, to remind us that the church is not a corporation. The church is a family. The church is a, an organism. It's a body. Swindoll quoting Ray Stedman, one of the uh, uh, modern day uh, uh, theologians. He says, we easily forget the church is a body. We have tried to operate the church as an institution, a corporation, as a business. But the reality Paul wants us to grasp in Ephesians is that the church is a body made up of cells, and the cells are individual believers, you and me and our other brothers and sisters in Christ. Each cell has a unique role to play in keeping the entire body healthy. So following this, his rapid fire list of leaders given to us here in, in, in verse, verse 11, Paul answers the why and the how question in the rest of our text tonight, 12 through 16. Why has the Lord gifted the body with these leadership gifts? And how do these relate to the spiritual gifts distributed throughout the entire body of Christ? Paul gives three reasons for God's gifts to the church and emphasizes four results of a healthy, full-bodied ministry of the Spirit. That in the process, Paul reveals three purposes, <laughs> three reasons, <laughs> three purposes for the gifted ministries of leadership in the church. There is an immediate purpose, there is an intermediary purpose, and there is an ultimate purpose. And we want to use those as our way of going forward. And this is a chart right from the, uh, from the commentary. Uh, you can go back and refer to this as a one, doc, one, one chart um, uh, iteration. We're going to take a look at that very quickly in uh, each of those three purposes, okay? The intermediary purpose of God's gift of leadership in the local church is to what? Equip every believer in the congregation to work toward building up the body of Christ. 
That is the phrase perfecting of the saints, to bring them to a place of perfection. Not, I know they're not going to be perfect, but we're striving toward perfection. You said interlude. That's a lead. I beg your pardon. Well, you could have told me up there, baby. I'm okay. Well, cut right in. I apologize. Uh, immediate, intermediary, and ultimate. I'm sorry. The immediate uh, purpose. Okay. Now, these three steps, Paul is saying to us that there's got to be some equipping, uh, some serving, and some building up. That, that's that's what Paul is 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 saying. That's going to bring us to this perfecting. Uh, should not be thought of as independent one of the other. They they are in combination. Uh, these these three equipping, serving, and building up are working in harmony. Okay. In fact, the first equipping the saints leads to the second, which is serving, which result in the third, and that is the building up or the edifying of the church, okay? And again, we're, we're, we're exchanging uh, words here, King James. Uh, Swindoll is using the New American Standard uh, uh, version, so all of his quotes are coming out of that. But I mean, it, it, whether we say build up or we're saying edify, uh, again, it's expanding our understanding so that uh, it's okay which version of the Bible we're reading out of, we know what what is being, what the concept of that word is giving us. So as a result of this equipping uh, um, or, or perfecting or, or, or <clears throat> members of the body learn to function in new ways, uh, certainly exercising their individual gifts for the benefit of the whole body under the direction and encouragement of these church leaders uh, defined in verse 11. Uh, the members of the congregation are equipped for the work of service. We, we, uh, our giftedness for the work of the ministry, the work of service. This is this is the reason why we have a gift, and uh, and we're exercising that gift, and we're on assignment. That's why we must we must grow where we we, we must be grow grow where we're planted. Uh, we we can't we can't church hop. We can't move from church to church. You never get to a place where you put down enough root uh, to, 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 to tap into the source that is being offered at that particular vineyard so that you can start to grow and to mature. You'll, you'll stay uh, dwarfed. You'll stay immature uh, until you are grounded and rooted somewhere uh, where you're under the discipline as not only the knowledge and the teaching, but under the discipline. Okay, a disciple is one who is disciplined. Okay, so so unfortunately, many churches hire staff people to do all the real work. That is, the congregation sits back with their arms folded and they observe or supervise while the hired hands do all the heavy lifting related to ministry. And keep in mind, title of our text uh, in this chapter of the of the. Uh, of uh, Swindoll's book is embracing a full-bodied ministry, okay? Not only that, but Swindoll quotes for us Howard, Dr. Howard Henderson, H Henderson, Hendricks, H Hendricks, Howard Hendricks, I apologize, uh, who says uh, the church, and, and, he's, and he's a great uh, Christian educator, Christian education, my, my goodness. Yeah, I've read several of his books. He said, the church is too much like a football game. 50,000 people in the stands, desperately in need of exercise, watching 22 people on the field, desperately in need of some rest. <laughs> I thought that was quite, uh, quite humorous. But true in, in, in all regards, okay, that the primary mission of the paid minister is to equip the rest of the church to engage in meeting the needs of the flock by exercising their own individual spiritual gifts for the benefit of all. We are all working at our best, uh, tapped into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, 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 um, 
um, um, encouraging and exalting each of us to be the very best, whatever the gift is, uh, so that we are all making contribution. We are contributing to the overall common good uh, by, by, by being the best that we can through these spiritual gifts uh, going forward. That's the immediate goal of having these gifts given to us there in, in verse 11. The intermediate goal then is promoting unity and maturity, knowledge, doctrinal stability and authenticity or, or, or authentic loving speech. How we talk to each other till we all come to the unity of the faith, knowledge and the perfect man or woman under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. The first sign of growing up, of a grown, a grown up congregation is that the believers will possess the unity of the faith. Wow. How, how, is, is, this, is, this a, is this a growing church or a declining church? Is this a uh, on fire church or is this a dead church? Is it just, I mean, it, how, how, what is the, what is the unity uh, like in this church? Is there, the, is there a unity of the faith? These include major doctrinal issues like the Trinity, um, the full deity and full humanity of Christ. Is there any, any argument or, or differences about the virgin birth? How about the atoning death of Christ to pay for our sins, the miraculous body resurrection of Christ, the promise of his future return? What about salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone? What about the understanding that the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture and similar orthodox and non-negotiable truths? Does the church possess the unity in the things of the faith? Okay, is that holding them together? Second sign of a grown up church or unified church congregation is that the believers possess a strong knowledge of the son of God. Do they know who God is and what Christ his son has done? The core doctrines of our Christian faith centers upon the person and work of Jesus Christ in his first and his second coming. <clears throat> we are to help believers know both, uh, to, to know Christ both factually and relationally both theologically and intimately, is a goal of the preaching and the teaching ministry of the church. Does the church teach and preach the understanding of who Christ is, his ultimate uh, 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 purpose, and the works, uh, ministry of what he has done, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his, his, his in, imminent return is all of that clear in the hearts of mind do they have the knowledge of the son of god he says this true knowledge touches not only the head but also the heart resulting in a life of devotion and dedication or are they driven by every wind of doctrine they they, they can't settle down and they find that every time a new preacher, a new this come into town, they flock to that church uh, to learn that new thing. Amen. Get that new thing. The third sign of a grown up congregation is expressed through not, the, the, not only the unity of the faith and the knowledge of God that leads them, that will lead them to a mature doctrinal stability. Okay. Um, uh, uh, there in, in verse 14, uh, that we henceforth be no more children tossed and driven. We're, we're not driven by every wind of doctrine. Uh, we're not carried about by the slight of man or cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. We have doctrinal stability. We know who we are and whose we are. 
Nothing is more tragic than adults who live clueless Christian lives like infants, especially those long-term believers who ought to be teachers but need somebody to teach them the elementary principles of the Christian faith that they have yet to grasp what it means, amen, to be fully mature. And Paul's going to talk about the whole arm of God when we get over to chapter six of, of this book of Ephesians. Paul frequently warned the congregations against false teachers, and the, and the Ephesian church was no exception. Yet false doctrine is not a thing of the past. In fact, throughout the centuries, Satan and his followers have continued to fabricate deceitful philosophies, false religions, and twisted versions of Christianity. There ain't no end to what the devil will attempt to do uh, to get us uh, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, okay? But what is it that we must do? And I like here what it says in verse 15. We got to speak the truth in love. We got to speak truth to power, yes, but the truth has to be in love because that's the fourth sign of a grown-up congregation that it is mature, that it is matured, that it is being built up, uh, coming to the uh, <clears throat> unity uh, for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. All of that comes to fruition when they are able to uh, when it when it is when that body is speaking the truth in love because the balance between truth and love is often difficult to maintain some of us are good at truth because we can spot the smallest inaccuracy in a person's theological expression and have no fear of pointing it out amen we become hypocritical now, you, you, that ain't how that, that ain't how that scripture goes. Uh, you misquoted that. that you know, well, fine. Okay. I love the fact that you know the truth. Okay. But others of us desiring to keep the peace, let false teaching go uncontested or allow lies to go uncorrected. We just can't bring ourselves to rock anybody's boat for fear that we will cause too many waves in the church. But God wants us to be neither abrasive nor timid. God wants us to show both strength and love. Truth becomes hard if it is not softened by love, and love becomes soft if it is not strengthened by the truth. Aren't you glad about that? And so we are fitly joined together because that is the ultimate purpose for these gifts given to the body of Christ. Amen. That we are perfected saints, that we are have, we have, we are working in our ministry, that we are, we are edifying uh, the body of Christ. And that is to, is, is the growth of the whole body through the loving cooperation of all of its members fitly joined together. Hallelujah. Fitly joined together. Because a human body is healthy when all of its parts are operating properly and working in harmony. Similarly, a church body is healthy when all of its members submit to the headship of Christ, walk in the spirit, contribute to the community with their gifts and talents, and they live in cooperation with each other. The body grows as the individual members grow, and the members grow as they feed on the word and minister that word to one another. Aren't you glad about that? Because the church doesn't become mature overnight. It takes time and patience and love. As God works through each individual's exercise of spiritual gifts for the sake of the others, God builds us up as a healthy, productive, and wholesome body. We need to trust 
the growth process as we individually contribute to the, to the project. Only then will we learn to embrace a full-bodied ministry as God designed it. Aren't you glad about that tonight? So may the Lord bless all of you and keep you. May God strengthen you. May God's word richly dwell in you, be gracious unto you, lift you up in a time of need, lift up your bow down head, amen, mend your broken heart and put salve on your wounded spirit at the proper time. Come that the Lord might lead us into a straight and narrow path. In Jesus' name we pray. The people said, amen. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Jacqueline, you